And hello and welcome to Worship with West Concord. Hope you're having a great day and a great week. So glad that you can join us today as we continue to go through the book of Malachi. And we've titled this series, Back from Captivity. Uh, because I believe the message of Malachi is very pertinent for us today. As the children of Israel had returned from a captivity, we are now in a captivity in this pandemic and we're slowly digging out of it. But there are lessons that we need to learn that God tried to teach the people in Malachi's day after their captivity, but they were slow to learn them. Hopefully we'll do a better job. We've already talked about the idea that Malachi is composed of six different oracles or burdens from the prophet that God laid on his heart. And we've looked at five. We're looking at the last oracle today, oracle number six. And uh, it's talking about complaining against God. And uh, we're all guilty of complaining. Let's face it. We've all complained here. We've complained there. I mean, I've been out with people where you're sitting at the table and the wait staff, the, the server brings you uh, your meal and it's just not good enough. It's just not right. And instead of saying something kindly and graciously, we chew out the wait staff, we chew out the server and, uh, and get all upset and get all hot and bothered and chase them back into the kitchen with it. You know, I often wonder, is that a good idea? Do we really want to get angry the person that is dealing with the food we're getting ready to eat? You know, I, I don't think that's probably a good idea, and I've learned to try not to do that. But complaining, listen, it goes on all the time, and yes, it goes on in the church. It goes on in the family of God. And it was going on with God's people uh, 2,400 years ago in Malachi's day. Because as they were about a hundred years out from being delivered from captivity, they were beginning to get lax, lazy, apathetic. And uh, as they began to slow their roll with God, as it were, God was pulling back from them. And they were suffering the consequences of God lifting His hand of blessing. Because they had literally began to just grow apathetic to God and the things of God. They were talking about how service to God was boring and unnecessary. They were bringing second-rate offerings to Him, bringing Him basically their cast-offs and their trash, thinking that would please Almighty God. They were doubting His love. They were disobedient. They struggled with so many areas. Go back and read Malachi. You'll see. You'll review what we've already talked about. And so as we look at this last oracle, they were complaining against God. Now, understand this about complaining. Complaining is a problem because it doubts the faithfulness of God. Complaining against God, at least. You know, when you have a problem, it's okay to bring a problem to somebody else. If, in fact, your meal is not what you ordered in the restaurant, then sure, call the server over and say, you know what, y'all work hard and I know everything is, is busy, but, you know, this isn't quite what I ordered. If it's possible, is there a way I can get this taken care of? I do appreciate it. You know, generally when you're nice, you get nice back. And, and, but, you know, it's okay to point out a problem. It's even okay to go to God with confusion, with questions and problems. But when we begin to complain against God, and specifically that's what we're talking about today, we're doubting God's faithfulness. I want to share with you a quote from a legendary missionary, a man by the name of Hudson Taylor. You've probably heard me and other pastors quote him before. He was a missionary to China back in the 19th century, and he was an incredible missionary, and he wrote so many wonderful things. And he says this about God's faithfulness and how we're to respond to it. He says, Our Heavenly Father is a very experienced one. He's a very experienced father. He knows very well that His children wake up uh, with a good appetite every morning. He knows we have need. He also sustained three million Israelites in the wilderness for 40 years. He did that for 40 years. He knows we have need. He says, we do not expect he will send 3 million missionaries to China, but if he did, he would have ample means to sustain them all. In other words, he's saying, listen, God is going to take care of us. He says, depend on it. God's work done in God's way will never lack God's support. Yet when we complain against God, we doubt his faithfulness. And the reason we do that is simply because God oftentimes is not going to do the things we want Him to do 
the way we want him to do them. Let me share with you another quote. This comes from theologian A.W. Pink. He said, the apprehension or the apprehending of this blessed truth, which is God's faithfulness, will check our murmurings. In other words, it'll calm our murmurings down. Because the Lord knows what is best for each of us. And one effect of resting on this truth will be the silencing of our petulant complaining. God is greatly honored when under trial and chastening, we have good thoughts of Him. We vindicate His wisdom and justice and recognize His love in His very rebukes. Even when things aren't going our way, even when God is dealing with us, when we understand that God is faithful to us, and even in the difficulty, even in the rebukes that He has to give us, He knows what is best for us. He's doing what is best for us. And so if we keep positive thoughts about Him and we lean into it, we roll into it, we will be better served and He will be better glorified. And so we're going to talk about the faithfulness of God. We're going to talk about complaining and how that is abrasive to that concept as we get ready to open up the book of Malachi this morning. But first, let's have a word of prayer and ask God's blessing as we open up the book. Father, we thank you, Lord, for this time together. Again, Father, we thank you for the privilege and opportunity, even though, Lord, we're still kind of closed in, we're still unable to get everybody back in church, we thank you that we can offer this opportunity online to gather around your word, Lord. And I pray that as we open the book of Malachi again, Father, you would speak to our hearts, that, Father, you would season us, prepare us, Lord, as we get ready to climb out of this captivity, I pray that I'm different. I pray that I'm transformed through it. I pray that I'm a better man and a better Christian because of it. And I pray that for those who are listening as well, that we all might be better, stronger, leaner, and more effective for Jesus Christ. Lord, bless us now. Let your word permeate our souls and our hearts, and we'll praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. So take your Bible and go to Malachi chapter 3, where we left off. And we're going to pick up in verse 13. We're going to talk about the complaining that was going on. And there was complaining going on, and God was done with it. He was tired of it. So in verse 13, he says this, Your words have been harsh against me. You know, you might just read over that, but listen to the pathos in that line. Your words have been harsh against me. I wonder how often in our frustration with God and in our dissatisfaction with God, that we have been harsh with God and how much it hurts and how much it grieves Him. And so God has a grievance here. He says, your words have been harsh against me, says the Lord. Yet you say, what have we spoken against you? Malachi repeats this motif time after time. God levies His charge and the people say, who, us? It's like a petulant child who, when caught doing something wrong, says, who? Me? I didn't do that. That's not me. And so they're saying, how, how have we done this? What have we done? And God had a grievance. And so God is going to talk about the grumbling from the people. Now, this is the first time God's people complained. You go back and read through the book of Genesis, through Exodus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Leviticus. God's people have been complaining since day one. And we do the same thing, and we need to, to work on that. He says in verse 14, You have said, It is useless to serve God. What profit is it that we have kept His ordinance? And what have we walked, and that, and rather, and that we have walked as mourners before the Lord of hosts? People are grumbling. What point is it to serve God? What's, it's useless to serve God. He said, Listen, this is the word you've been speaking to me. These are the words. What profit is it that we have kept your ordinance? which they really haven't been, if you remember our last message. They had turned their backs on the ordinances of God, but they didn't see that in their eyes. No, no, they were keeping those ordinances, and yet they weren't being blessed because of it, and they were saying, what's the point? You know, we don't serve God just to be blessed, by the way. We serve God in gratitude with a grateful spirit for the salvation that has been won for us. We serve God because we are grateful to Him for what He's given to us. You know, there's an old song by Evie Tornquist. Probably nobody remembers who she was. She was a little four foot eleven blonde lady who just when contemporary Christian music was coming out, she was one of the leaders of it. Now, she would be considered rather old-fashioned and stale today. But she had a song, and one of the lines in it said, if Ev <clears throat> she said, if heaven had never been promised to me, it's been good just serving the Lord. 
It's been good just having him in my life. But they said it's useless to serve the Lord because, man, what profit is it that uh, we serve him and there's no blessing? We've been keeping the ordinances. No, they actually haven't. And, what, and that we've walked in the, as mourners before the Lord. And what, what has that done for us? So they were grumbling about the fact that, oh, we're giving our hearts and lives to the Lord. We're walking with the Lord. We weep before Him. And He does nothing. When the reality is, as He pointed out last time, and as He's been pointing out, they were not doing the things that they claimed they were doing. They were not keeping His ordinances. They were not walking before Him. And as we said, as, as such, they were losing His blessing, struggling with it. Now they're saying, well, what's the profit of doing all this? Well, when you don't do it, there is no profit. But nonetheless, just because you serve the Lord doesn't mean life is going to be just parties and fun all the time. There are difficulties in life. There are struggles in life. The blessing is God enabling us to get through those things. So God's grievance was, listen, you've spoken harsh words to me. You've complained and grumbled against me. And so they were grumbling against God, but they were also grousing among themselves. Grousing is grumbling with an attitude. Grousing is grumbling, and that's the Hebrew word that, that is used in this passage. It's grumbling, but with a weaponized attitude. They wanted to make a point. So verse 15. So now we call the proud blessed. For those who do wickedness are raised up. They even tempt God and go free. I mean, they're saying, but you know, look, these people who aren't doing anything for the Lord, these, these pagans, these, these people who don't know God, they're, they're happy. Their lives are great. They have good health. They have plenty to eat. They're happy. And they're doing well. And you know what? Sometimes it does look like that from the inside out. <clears throat> as we look at the world, as we see the world, you know, you go on social media. Boy, that's a poison. You go on social media and you see all oh, this perfect family. You know, you see the pictures of the perfect family at the beach, the perfect family out to eat, the perfect family in their living room. Can I tell you a little secret? Those are one-time pictures. Might be a good family. They might be having a good time at the moment. But you didn't see them after the picture at the beach was snapped that somebody argued the fact that somebody stepped on their castle or somebody didn't get the soda they wanted, and it all turned south. We didn't see that part of it. Because, listen, we're all human. We all struggle. But the blessing of serving God is the ability to get through that struggle, the ability to have that strength. And yes, when we do do His ordinances, when we do grieve before Him and stand before Him and lay our lives before Him, there are blessings that come. They may not be material blessings that you can touch, handle, hold, and spend, but they're blessings of the Spirit, blessings of life nonetheless. So they were complaining against God. They were whining against Him. They were grousing against him. They were grumping against him. And God was not happy with it. It was hurting him. It was frustrating him. And they really shouldn't have had anything to complain about because God had delivered them from slavery and oppression. God had raised them out of that, yet they still complained. Listen, I'm a believer in Jesus Christ. Back when I was 16, I came to know Christ. I'm saved. I'm, I'm, if I were to drop dead now, I'd go to heaven. Not only that, but I have God's Spirit living in me. God wants to walk with me. He's, he's created a relationship with me. He wants to have fellowship with me. Man, if that's all I had, I would be blessed. But unfortunately, like you, I catch myself complaining sometimes. And I know it grieves the Spirit of God. And God can't stand complaining. God can't stand whining. Listen, you're, some of you are parents. A lot of you are parents, grandparents. Doesn't it just grate on your nerves when your children whine and complain? Doesn't that, and, and not just children, but how about adults? My daughter works at one of the restaurants here in Harrisburg. And uh, she gets more complaints than she does positive feedback. Some people are downright hateful and mean. Some people use language that I wouldn't repeat to anybody. And they tear her apart, and she's simply trying to do her job. And the sad part about it is she knows because she sees the stickers and the jewelry, they claim to be Christian. How amazing and what a horrible testimony. So God is frustrated with the complaining and the complainers, those who complain. So I want you to look now, we're going to go down to verse 16, because we're going to look at another group that God mentions here. This is the first time God is comparing groups in this book. Because what God wants to see a contrast. So we looked at the complaining people, but God now wants, to, wants us to look at the contented people. He wants us to look at the people who are, con who are content with their way their lives are going. They're not perfect. They're struggling. There's some problems. There's some blessings. But they're content. They're, they have enough. And I want you to notice what God says about those who, rather than complain, live content, grateful lives. 
He says, first of all, in verse 16, then those who feared the Lord spoke to one another. Now, did you catch that? Don't let that get away. Those who feared the Lord, they reverentially respected God and they understood that He was faithful to Him. The people that complain against God, number one, don't believe God is faithful. Don't believe God is smart enough to provide and take care of us. When we complain about God and to God, we're basically saying, God, you don't know what you're doing. God, you're not as smart as I am. I know what I need. I know what I want. And you're not doing it. Therefore, shame on you. And, and we're saying, God, you're not smart enough. Plus, we're not treating him with respect. And that's what the word fear here means. It means a reverential holy respect of God. So those people that still had respect for God, they kind of got in a group and they began to speak to each other. And the Lord listened to them. Catch that line and don't let it slip by. The Lord listened to them. You know, oftentimes God gets tired of hearing our whining and complaining. He even said back in the earlier chapters we looked at, God was wearisome of their words. You get tired of it in 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 an anthropomorphic sense. He said, I'm weary of it. But when the people that fear God and love Him and count on His faithfulness, when they get together and talk, God listens. And notice, I want you to notice three things about this group. These are the contented people. These are the people that don't sit and whine against God, complain to Him. They are happy with their lot in life. They trust God to take care of them and do the right thing. They trust God to provide for for them in His way, to guide them in His way. Yes, even to let them go through difficulty, just like we're going through today. You know, we're going through a pandemic. It's a mess. We're going through a racial uh, turmoil. It's a mess. We're going through political corruption, journalistic uh, malfeasance. This whole world is just in a swirl. And we sit there and say, God, why do you let this happen? Why is this going on? Fact of the matter is, God is letting it happen. And it is going on. And He's still faithful. He's letting us go through it. And rather than complain against Him, this is the whole point of this sermon series. We need to roll into it, lean into it, and let God do what He wants to do because that teaches us faithfulness to God because of the faithfulness of God, and it also helps us to reverently respect Him. So they were were the contented people. I want you to notice, first of all, this is how God deals with them and considers them. First, they will be remembered by God. They will be remembered by God. Look at the passage here as we continue. He says in verse uh, 16, And the Lord listened and heard them, so a book of remembrance was written before Him for those who fear the Lord and who meditate on His name. There is a book of remembrance, and this is pretty much the only place in the Bible you're going to see this referenced, a book of remembrance Now, we know from from Scripture that we will be judged one day. We will stand before the judgment seat of Christ. And as believers, we'll be judged determining our our service or lack thereof, our faithfulness or lack thereof. And perhaps this is where the the charges, the evidence, the uh, circumstances will come from. But as a believer, I want to be written in this book. I want to be remembered as someone who feared God, not disappearing from this book because I whined and complained against him. And again, when we whine and complain against God, we are showing a lack of faith and respect for God. And so, yes, God will listen and God will remember those who are faithful, those who fear him and those who trust him. So he will remember them. Not only that, but he will value them in a unique way. Look at verse 17. And they shall be mine says the Lord of hosts. You know, all of God's people are His, but those who fear Him and trust Him will be in a special, unique position. They shall be mine. I'll explain that in this next line. On the day that I make them my jewels. Now, again, this is another word that if you're not careful, you'll read over. The Greek word here is segula. I mean, the Hebrew word, excuse me, we're in the Old Testament. The Hebrew word is the word segula. And it literally means treasure. But not just a treasure. It is a treasure that is held close. It is a treasure that is put away and hidden for safekeeping. It is so valuable and so valued that the person who treasures it doesn't want it to escape them. My mother-in-law was an antique dealer. And when she died, we had the task of cleaning out her house. And oh my goodness, it was a mess. But the things she treasured most 
jewelry and different things, she kept under her couch where she sat. And she slept on her couch too. She kept all of those most valued things close to her so that she always knew where they were. And if they would come under threat, she could protect them first. And this is how God values those who are contented and trust His faithfulness and respect Him. Not only does He write their names in a book of remembrance for future reward and blessing, but He also values them like a treasure which He holds close to His heart. I want to be in that group, don't you? He values them. He hears them. He remembers them. But not only that, He says He spares them. Look as we finish verse 17. He says, and I will spare them as a man spares his own son who serves him. It's an interesting, he will spare us. Spare us from what? Spare us from the severity of judgment. And again, yes, even believers will stand before the judgment seat of Christ and give an account for their lives. But if we've lived our lives according to the faithfulness of God, respecting God and trusting Him and living that out, then we will be spared much of the difficulty that comes in judgment. And God says, I will spare you as one who spares his own son who loves him and serves him. And that's, that's the beauty of this group. That's what we want to be involved in. The one group was griping, grumbling, complaining, grousing. They just weren't happy with God. They were upset with him. They were harsh to him. Do you think God wants to really honor and remember those people? Even in the New Testament, Jesus said, God will honor in heaven those who honor Him here on earth and vice versa. God will dishonor in heaven those who dishonor Him here on earth. You know, this is a real thing. Our lives matter. Our choices matter. Our attitudes matter. But the people who are contented, the people who accept God's treatment of them, God's provision for them, God's guidance of them, even through difficult, tough times like we're going through, Instead of sitting around and complaining and whining, grumbling and grousing, we need to just sit down and say, you know what, God, this is hard. There's nothing wrong with saying, God, this is hard, and I don't like it. But God, thank you for bringing me in it, and thank you for bringing me through it. And that's the thing. You know, I don't like everything God does in my life. I struggle with a lot of things that God has allowed in my life especially over the last year, this has been one of the most difficult years of my life as an adult. It's been hard and difficult dealing with physical problems as well as the cultural and geopolitical problems and the pandemic around us. This has been a tough year. And I have a feeling for many of you, this is probably the tough year, toughest year you've ever been through. And my heart goes out to you. I understand. It's hard and it's okay to cry and it's okay to go to God and say, God, this is so hard. This is so difficult, but it's when we start charging God, we start complaining, we start whining. You know, it's one thing to say, God, this is hard and I don't like it. It's another thing to say, why are you doing this, God? Why are you harming me? What's your point? Do something. That's when we get in trouble. We need to go to God in fear and respect and say, Lord, I don't like it, but I know you love me. How do I know he loves me? The cross of Jesus Christ. I know you love me, and because you love me, you want the best for me. And if you think this is the best for me, God, I'll be all right. And you'll get me through it one way or another. And, and, and the fact of the matter is, if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, one way or another, we're going to come out of this pandemic. We're going to come through this difficulty, and we're going to be better for it. However it turns out, because we belong to God. Through Jesus Christ, we're going to come through it. So the contented, He remembers them, He values them, and He spares them. So how do you know where you are? How do you know which camp you're in? Well, he, he finishes by talking about the contrast between these two groups. And this is how you can look and see, am I where I need to be? And the contrast, because God is all about contrasts. You know, we make the Bible harder than it needs to be. We, like, we look for gray areas because gray areas make us comfortable. We don't have to be accountable for gray areas. But here's the reality. There aren't that many gray areas in the Bible. There are very few of them because God, even in difficult passages, those passages are understood in light of clearer passages. There's not a lot of gray areas in God. There's not a lot of gray areas in the Christian life. Actually, there are very few, if any. God is very black and white, up and down, right and left in His, in His moral dealings with us. We look again for gray areas because we want to get away with stuff. We want to do stuff and not be held accountable for it. Hogwash. Sorry, that's a Greek word which means 
hogwash. Okay, it's crazy. So here's the contrast that God lays. Look at verse 18. He says, then you shall, you shall again discern. He said, I want you to think. You shall again discern between the righteous and the wicked, between one who serves God and one who does not serve Him. I want you to notice the contrast that he gives us here. The contrast is between, first of all, attitudes. The righteous and the wicked. It starts with your attitude. It starts with my attitude. A righteous attitude falls under the purview of the contented. Again, fearing God, respecting God, trusting God's faithfulness, walking with Him and being contented no matter what your lot in life is. And that's, that's the righteous attitude. That's the correct attitude. The wicked attitude is cursing God, whining against God, doubting God, disputing God, charging God, fussing at God, and ultimately ignoring God because you think you've been treated poorly by Him. And I'll tell you, if you're a believer, even if you're not a believer, listen to me, God does love you. You know, there are times growing up, my dad was a disciplinarian. He was never harsh or cruel, never beat us or abuse, anything like that. But my dad was military. And my dad had a very black and white sense of right and wrong. And he drew the lines. And if you cross those lines, you were disciplined. You got dealt with. But my dad still loved me. And at the end of that, we were fine. Again, he never abused me, never did anything uh, wrong. Uh, but at the time, I thought he was the next thing to Hitler. At the time, I couldn't stand him because I thought he was mean, harsh, cruel. But now that I look back 50 years later, he was right just about every time. And he did those things, and I had to endure them, punishments, disciplines, because he loved me and wanted me to grow up and be a good man. My dad always said, I don't raise children, I raise adults. And so he, he wanted me to grow up and be a good man. He didn't like disciplining me and my brother and sister. He didn't like punishing us. He didn't get his jollies from that. But he did it because he loved us. And I've tried to do that, and other parents try to do that with their children because they want their children to grow up and be good people, especially Christians, because they want their children to grow up and honor and love God. So the contrast between attitudes, because your actions start with your attitudes. And that's the next thing, the contrast between actions. You can look at somebody's actions. You can listen to what they say to know that they're the contented or the complaining. Listen, I've been out to lunch with church members. I've been places with church members. I've been embarrassed by church members. I love y'all, don't get me wrong, but I've been embarrassed how church members will treat wait staff or servers at a restaurant. I've been embarrassed how people treat their doctors and nurses in the hospital. You know, again, complaining, whining, it's not going to accomplish anything. And it's also not very bright. Because as I said before, if you're in a restaurant and you tear the waiter or the waitress apart, the server apart, how do you know they're not going to take your plate back, fix it, and then spit on it? I, I, I don't want to open that up for that. And when I'm in the hospital, these people are pouring chemicals in me and poking me with stuff. I'm not going to get them mad. Or a police officer, if I get pulled over and I know I didn't do anything, but he or she is charging me with something, I'm going to say, yes, ma'am, yes, sir, and take it. And if i got a problem, I'll take it to court and deal with it reasonably. Again, it's not only spiritually righteous and correct to have the right attitude of contentment, but it's also smart to do that because you will be treated most of the time the way you treat people. So that's the contrast, the contrast between attitudes, the contrast between actions. What does the verse say again? Then you shall again discern. It means to judge between. Between the righteous and the wicked, between one who serves God and one who does not serve God. You need to ask yourself, which group do you fall into? Have you been in that critical, complaining, griping, and grousing group? You know, the fact of the matter is, I found myself there on many occasions. And after I find it, and after I come away from it, I'm embarrassed of myself. And I might have embarrassed somebody else as, as well, my family or a friend. And uh, so you and me both, we need to seek out, and we need to be contented and seek out contentment in God. Because... It starts with our attitudes, and then it moves into our actions. Maya Angelou, who is a poet, an American poet, uh, had this to say. And again, she's a secular poet. I don't agree with everything she says, but she's very wise in this quote. And she says this, What you're supposed to do when you don't like a thing is change it. If you don't like something, is it in your power to change it? If you can't change it, change the way you think about it. 
but don't complain. Again, if it's your power to change something, change it. But if you can't change it, change the way you respond and react to it. Change the way you think about it and don't complain. Now let's take that quote and put it in the Christian context. And I take you back to the book of Philippians where we had our last study. I take you back to Philippians chapter 2. And if there was anybody who ever walked the face of the earth to have genuine reason to complain, it was our Lord Jesus Christ. You think life is unfair to you? How fair do you think it is for someone who's never done anything wrong to be punished for sins he never committed? Talk about getting our mind changed. Look what Paul said in Philippians 2. In verse 5, he said, Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus. Who? Being in the form of God, Jesus is God in the flesh, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God. In other words, this is an interesting word. It's not well translated in English, but he said he didn't consider his godness to something that he had to hold on to and grasp at. He didn't consider his position, his divinity, all of those things, his home in heaven, his, his position as the second member of the Trinity. He didn't consider that something he had to grasp and cling to because he had to leave that and veil himself in flesh. He goes on to say, but made himself of no reputation. Made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bond servant. You know, he left and he was God. Who has a better reputation and name than God? But he left that and abandoned that reputation. He was born in a hog trough in Bethlehem. He didn't come as a prince. He came as a bond servant. He goes on to say this, and coming in the likeness of men. Coming in the likeness of men. What does that mean? He says he was like us. He had a body that felt what we felt, endured what we endured, suffered what we suffer. Everything you've experienced emotionally, physically, he's experienced that in some way or another. You can go through the Old Testament, I mean, rather the New Testament, and pick that out. He said, and being found in the appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. He didn't do anything wrong. He was God. He had everything. He owned everything. He was everything. But because of my sin and because of your sin, He left that. He set it aside. He veiled Himself in all too human flesh, not as a prince, not as a potentate, but as a pauper a poor man, a bondservant, feeling heat when it's hot, feeling chilled when it's cold, feeling hungry when he was hungry. He struggled with the things in life. He was betrayed. He was, he was then taken and brutally crucified. He was obedient and humbled himself to, to the point of death. And not just to death. Listen, he didn't die on silken sheets in a comfortable bed. He died naked, nailed to a rugged, horrible cross. If anybody had anything to complain about, he did. If you ever say life isn't fair to you again, or God isn't fair to you again, let me ask you a question. Was it fair for Jesus to, to suffer and to die the way he did for you and me? Is that fair? From an earthly standpoint, it's not. But God apparently felt, felt like it was. The Bible then tells us in that passage that he raised Jesus up because Jesus was obedient. And he said, and at the, at the name of Jesus, one day every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that he is Lord of all. And then Paul, a little bit later in the chapter, summarizes all of this thought process this way. He says in uh, Philippians chapter 2, verse 14, as we jump down, in verses 14 and 15, he says, Do all things without complaining and disputing. He said, do all things, not some things, not church things, not secular, all things, do all things without complaining and disputing. Why? That you may become blameless and harmless, the children of God without fault in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation. Do we live in a crooked and perverse generation? Have you looked at social media? Have you looked at the news? Have you watched what's been going on? See, we are to be salt and light in this world. We're to be different. We're not to be sitting around complaining about our lot in life and complaining about how we've been abused or misused in life. You know, everybody today is complaining about how, oh, I've been misused, my relatives have been misused, you've been misused. No, 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 no. 
We are to stand before God and stand out as salt and light and say, yep, my life is a mess at times. I've been misused. I've been hurt. I've lost things. I've, I've gone through this. But God is good. And not complain. Because then we began to shine the light of glory upon God. He says, among whom you shine as lights in the world. We are to shine His glory. Listen, you're going to sit and complain and be a whining ball of flesh. Can I tell you a little secret? Nobody wants to hear it. Nobody wants to be around that. I'll tell you who I want to be around, somebody who's giving glory to God. And yes, I'm guilty of complaining sometimes too. But I thank God that I can run back to His Word and confess that sin. And complaining is a sin. Let's, let's cut to the chase. Complaining is a sin against God because it doubts God's faithfulness and it disrespects Him. So I ask you this morning, what have you got to complain about? I know life is tough. You may have, be having financial problems because of the COVID virus. You may be struggling with your health. I get that. I understand that. You may be having family issues. There may be all kinds of problems you're dealing with, and it's hard. But understand this. Life is hard in this world. It's a broken, fallen world. But through the grace of Almighty God and through Jesus Christ, we have, first of all, the anticipation of salvation through faith in Him. We understand that as difficult as this world is, we're not going to be here forever. James tells us that life is like a vapor. It appears for a little time and vanishes away. You know, I look at my life in my late 50s and I think, where has it gone? Where did it go? It flew by. Life is like a vapor, like over your coffee. It's there for a little while, but then it disappears. What have we got to complain about? If you're able to listen and watch this video, if you're able to interact with it, you might be having troubles, and God bless you. I know it's hard. And yes, take those problems to God. Lay them at His feet with respect. Weep before Him if necessary. Don't you think, you know, somebody one time... Uh, gave a person a hard time because they were weeping because a loved one was struggling in the hospital. And the person looked at this man's wife and said, how dare you weep? You're a, children, you're, you're a Christian, rather. Buck up. I told her, you have my personal permission that if they ever say that again, slap them right in the mouth. No, I really didn't want her to do that. But understand this. Don't you think that Mary at the foot of the cross, Jesus' mother, she knew who he was. She knew why he came. She knew he was the savior of the world, but don't you think she grieved and moaned and cried when she watched her son being abused on the cross? It's okay to cry. It's okay to go to God and seek answers. It's okay to lay your burdens at his feet. He asked us to do that. He said in, in the New Testament, cast all your care upon me for I care for you. But as you do that, trust him with the outcome. Trust him with the answers. Because he died for you. That's why Jesus came to take the burden of our sin off of us and upon himself. He died, paid for it, was buried. Three days later, he rose again from the dead. And if we would come to him by faith, receiving him as our savior, God would save us. And as saved people, God will walk with us and get us through. And God will take care of us. He knows we're hungry. He knows we struggle. He knows we hurt. He knows we're broken. If we will lay our lives on the altar, God will get us through. And then one day we'll be in heaven. And oh my goodness, what a celebration that is. But until then, listen, my life and your life will be a lot easier to get through if we step away from the complaint department. Let's have a word of prayer. Father, we live in a difficult world. It's full of pain, deprivation. It's full of heartache, loss, and Lord, sometimes it's so hard. But Lord, this is nothing you don't understand because your son endured the same things that we're enduring. So Father, help us to not complain, but help us to be contented. Help us to trust you. And Lord, may we be the ones who fear you and trust your faithfulness so that we might be in your book of remembrance. So we might be held close to your breast as valued treasure. And so that we, as we stand before you at the judgment seat of Christ, you might spare us from its harshness. Father, help me to be that person. Forgive me where I have failed you many times. Speak to my heart through your word today, Lord, and those who are listening. We'll thank you in Jesus' name.
Thank you so much for watching and listening. I hope to see you soon. Take care.